Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're finally going to tame this volcano. Except, we're going to do it the right way this time. We're going to spend a lot of time in the detail on it to make sure that we're able to extract every little bit of heat from it and then be able to use that igneous rock at the same time. We're also going to start exploring some of these other planetoids. There's a few others that we kind of want to touch down onto to see what they look like. Now, when you go over and click Oversee Planetoid on, you can kind of get a general grasp of what's in there, but not completely. You kind of want to get at least 10 tiles, maybe 20 tiles deep to really see what's on that planetoid. See if there's anything of interest right up from the rip. Specifically, we're going to look for the tree. My guess is it's either on Timberial or Rekiel. In fact, my guess is sitting right here on Rekiel. I figured it'd be another way to build another rocket. And this time, instead of the dupe actually leaving, the dupe will stay on the rocket. We're going to send a Trailblazer module down there to take a look at it for us. But the main subject today is going to be this major volcano. As luck would have it, we only have 11 cycles till it's dormant, which is both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is the fact that we're going to be able to get in there and work with it and be able to maintain a vacuum without worrying about magma coming in on us. The bad thing is then we're going to have to wait 70 cycles for the thing to go off again. Plenty of time for us to be able to work and perfect our design. Now, our design is going to have a couple of key features. First, we're going to utilize a magma dropper. The magma dropper will allow us to dictate how much magma we're getting at one time. Second, is we're also going to take the igneous rock and file it through the steam room. A lot of magma droppers, the igneous rock either becomes trapped and the heat just siphoned out of it, or it's destroyed. We want that igneous rock. So I think step one is going to be able to vacuum an entire section out. I don't know if we're going to need this much space, but we'll see. While the dupes finish that, it's time to design our next rocket. This one's going to be... Strictly an exploratory rocket. We're going to go with the petroleum engine because we have a lot of petroleum still left to use. And it's easier than grabbing the rad bolts from way over there. Alright, I think this is going to give us a good enough framework to start with. Step one is going to be to vacuum out this entire area. And because there's so many nooks and crannies, it's going to take a second. We'll probably use a couple of different gas pumps. That ought to be good. We don't care too much about these gases. We'll just vent them over next to us. And now we need to set up our little liquid lock. So I wanted to show you something a little odd. Elita is making her second run over to the Gilded Asteroid Field. Remember, in the last episode, I told you you could uncheck some of the items in the large cargo container and say, hey, I only want to pick up the gold and the fullerene. Well, we did that this time. And if you highlight over the large cargo bay, which says it has 20 tons out of 27, you can kind of see it. It's kind of chopped off in the screen, but it says it only has two tons of fullerene and five tons of gold. When you come back up here, though, it says, hey, the cargo capacity remaining in this is only seven tons. We have a lot more cargo capacity remaining than seven tons if we're only holding seven tons. We're going to take Venus 5 back to Fertilla and investigate more. But needless to say, the functionality is still a little buggy with these asteroid fields. Speaking of rockets, our exploration rocket is finally complete. And I believe earlier I said Trailblazer module. I should have said Rover's module. Because we're not going to touch foot on any of the planetoids. Only Rover is going to do that. Additionally, what you see here is three large liquid fuel tanks. This is a ton of fuel and we have the oxidization to match it. We have a large solid oxidizer full of 900 kilos of oxalite, and then we have a smaller oxidizer tank full of 450. Remember, the ratio from fuel to oxalite is two to one. We have 2,700 kilos of petroleum, therefore we need 1,350 of oxalite. Finally, we have Rover's module and the Solo Spacefarer nose cone. Now I know what you're thinking, why not just use the big spacefarer module and make it more comfortable for our duplicate? Well, first of all, because we're sending Megatron in, who cares? Second of all, because the small spacefarer module has a module burden of three. The larger one has a module burden of six. 
And the great thing about this rocket is it can go 18 tiles. 18 tiles will get us to any planetoid on the star map that we wish to go and get us back safely. Now remember, your range only depends on the fuel that you're using and the oxidizer. So that's the reason why we're able to go 18 tiles. But the burden heavily impacts the rocket speed. Even with this big chungus rocket, we're still going to be going 1.2 tiles per cycle. And again, it's Megatron. Our least favorite dupe, so who cares? Now let's see how Megatrons are going to be living. It's not pretty. Right now we have the refrigerator in here. It's just going to do some dropping off of the berry sludge. Eventually we're going to put a cot here. We're going to have one beautiful aero pot with a joyous seat in it. So there's at least a little bit of decor. The key is to making sure that Megatron doesn't break. Because remember, there's not going to be any rooms in here. I mean, he doesn't even have an opportunity to wash his hands after he uses the outhouse. So what we've done is we've skill scrubbed Megatron. The only thing Megatron needs to do to pilot that rocket is rocket piloting. That's it. Now, if we wanted to, we could give him advanced research and then into rocket piloting too, but that would be more of a morale requirement. We don't care much for the morale requirement. So for now, Megatron will just be a basic rocket pilot. Like, literally. It doesn't get any more basic than this. We are just about ready to send Megatron on his way, but I wanted to show you a small difference in decor. We have one Jump and Joy in here to provide a little bit more decor, so it's, you know, we don't want to be too cruel to Megatron. You can see here, when it's calculating the decor, it's giving it a plus six for the normal tile, but a minus four and a half for the mesh tile. This is something to keep in mind when you're building little spaces like this, that every little bit of decor will matter. Now, normally in a larger rocket, we use mesh tiles because we want that carbon dioxide to fall, and we're trying to maintain room. Well, we have no rooms to maintain here, so we can actually just use two granite tiles. You can see now, because of the two granite tiles, we're getting a plus 12 to the core on this one tile alone, instead of a minus 9 based on two mesh tiles. It's not bad for a 21 decor swing. With that, I believe we are ready to send Megatron on his way. We've got the crew set. We'll set the destination. At first, we'll go orbit Rekiel. Looks like pre-fight ignition has started. We are ready to go. Now that we have the volcano room vacuumed out, we're about ready to get started on sort of the finer mechanics of how this is going to work. There's a couple of things you need to know about volcanoes. What we're going to do is make a magma dropper, which means magma will slowly fill this room and only a little bit will come down through here. And then what will happen is it'll form what's called a magma blade. A magma blade just means when the magma is falling down here, because of how viscous it is, it will only go 10 tiles. You can see up to this door, is nine tiles and the door tile is the tenth. Speaking of magma, we can go ahead and, and let this volcano free. You can see that it is now dormant and will not erupt again for 65 cycles. So why this door? Well, this one's a little complicated to explain. Let me continue a little bit more construction and I'll be able to show you why. Wanted to give you a quick update on Megatron. Here's his morale. He's getting plus 8 from a good meal, plus 3 from last cycle's decor. That's huge. That's a big difference, a big swing. Plus 2 for a 3 shift break, plus 1 for being a duplicate, and plus 1 because he learned his one interesting skill of rocketry. So that means he's getting plus 15 positive morale. When we check out the skill list, he only has a morale requirement of 1. This crappy little rocket module is giving him 15 morale. Old Megatron has made it with the rover's module over to Rekiel. Now all we have to do is click deploy and then decide where we want old rover to go. Now, rover only has so much of a lifespan, so we need to make sure that we're careful. Oh, it's another artifact. What is this one? It's the honey jar. 
Oh, we're definitely going to need the honey jar. But Rover can't open this door. Rover doesn't have that dupe DNA to be able to verify his access and get in. This is why I think this is probably the space with our magical tree. But I think for simplicity, we'll deploy Rover right here. And here's little Rover. You notice he has a chemical battery of 180 kilojoules. Just getting out of the little Rover module, he's already down 0.1 kilojoules, so he doesn't have long. But as soon as the module lands, it opens up a lot of visibility. What is this? It's another artifact. A grub statue. We want that one too. The issue is I don't see much around here. Let's just go ahead and bore in and see what Rover can find. You'll notice Rover's taking a long time between commands. And I think this is because he's on the critter timeline as far as when to do what. You'll notice critters stay paused for a little bit longer than your dupes when your game starts bogging down. That's the reason why I believe that Rover's definitely not on the dupe priority system. I think he's probably on the critter priority system. With Rover deployed, there's no reason why we have to leave this module back here. We can send it back to Fertilla, get it refueled, and then off to the next planetoid. All right, Elita has returned, and you'll notice they still picked up sedimentary rock and refined carbon, even though we only selected gold and fullerene. Now, it does look like it picked up gold and fullerene first, but then it kept going, even though we don't have those selected. And you can see here the port unloader is unloading all the regolith and sedimentary rock and everything else. The difference in Rover's capabilities. Rover can build tiles, but he can't build airlocks. So anything mechanical requires a duplicate to be able to build. But Rover is still able to build some regular tiles, which is important because we want to keep the oxygen in here for when our dupes finally do get here. I'm having a world of a time trying to see in here. Normally, you can sort of poke through. Because Rover can't see any of these tiles, he can't deconstruct them or dig them out. But let's keep going down, shall we? Let's see if Rover can swim. And the answer is yes, Rover can go underwater. But it does not look like I'm going to be able to see what's inside here. Which just makes me think it is going to be the tree. We're going to check out Timberial just in case. For those of you wondering why we're so passionate about trying to find this magical tree. is because in the DLC it is your source of resin which you can then turn into iso resin which is needed for such great things like insulation and visco gel. In the background, we've recruited another dupe. This is Sideswipe. He enjoys suit wearing and ranching and is a quick learner. And at last, here is our 24th dupe. Stinky is a supplying and suit wearing animal. He's also got mole hands and the only disadvantage is uh, he's got a tiny little kitty bladder. Welcome to the colony, Magnus. So unfortunately, the rover on Rekuel is of no more. It is shut down from a lack of power. I wish there was a way to recharge these guys. It's kind of sad knowing that there's no way to, you know, plug them into something and get them to working again. That rover gave his life to explore Rekuel. Did a decent job all the way down to the magma biome. Guessing this is where the tree is. It makes perfect sense. They put it behind two bioscan doors. But don't be too sad for a rover. Because we have another one over on Timberial. So far, this rover has shown us most of this planetoid. I don't think the tree is going to be here. I think it is definitely on the swampy mess that is Rekiel. But we'll keep letting rover number two explore the area and see what they find. It takes them an awful long time again because they're on that critter priority system. This is on times nine speed. Uh-huh. I think we're about ready to show you the inner workings of this monstrosity. I think it's about done. The only thing we're really waiting for is the volcano to erupt. There's a lot of little things in here that you need to know about. Mostly, the automation. When the magnum drops down here, just a little bit is going to touch this door. And we only want a little bit of magma at a time. That way, our giant steam room is able to handle it. Now, the automation here has to do with a memory toggle, a buffer gate, and a filter gate. This one takes me a little while to get my mind wrapped around it, 
every time I build one. Francis John did an excellent tutorial on a magma drop system. It's not just like this, uh, but the automation behind it is the same. This automation comes in handy anytime you want a door to just open and close. That's it. For that, I've built a small example. It's just a little bit easier to explain when it's all spread out like this. We start with our thermo sensor. The thermo sensor in our real world example is just going to detect whether or not this steam room's too cold and thus it needs more magma. When it does, it's going to open this door and a little bit of magma is going to fall through. Which reminds me, I need another temperature shift plate right there. So once this thermo sensor detects that, hey, it's too cold, and in this example, we'll just click it to above. What happens is it sends us a green signal to the set on the memory toggle. Once it's set, it sends the green signal across the output over to this beautiful buffer gate. The buffer gate sends a green signal for a predetermined amount of time. In this case, 10 seconds. Here's this green signal that's sent to the filter gate. The filter gate says, hey, I've received a green signal for X amount of time. I need to go ahead and send one out. Once it does, it sends it to the reset port on the memory toggle, which flips the whole thing back again. I know that is awfully complicated. Basically, what you need to know is the buffer gate decides how long the door will stay closed for, and the filter gate decides how long it'll stay open for. You can see in this example, we have the filter gate set to two seconds. It's open for two and then shuts again. Because after the two seconds is when it sends its green signal back to the reset port and sets up the whole thing again. In our real life case, we have the filter gate set on just a half a second. Just enough time to give us a little bit of magma. And you can see the door just opens and quickly shuts. So in our giant monstrosity of a steam room, we're gonna set this thermal sensor to about 180 degrees. When the temperature in this steam room is below 180 degrees, it's going to open this door. When it does, the door will stay open just long enough for it to let a little bit of magma from the magma blade fall and drop off into this tile. Here's what you need to know about these two mesh tiles. When debris forms from the liquid magma, it would have two options. It could go up or it could go diagonally out. But because there's two mesh tiles here, the debris will not form above it. It will only push it out to the side. Once it does, it drops down to this tile and heats this area. When it does drop, our auto sweeper here is just in range to pick it up and drop it off in this conveyor loader. We have the auto sweeper and the conveyor loader as far away from the area as possible. For the simple reason, we don't want to risk melting the auto sweeper or the conveyor loader. Everything here is made out of steel, save the conveyor rails are made out of iron ore, and the tiles that are made out of obsidian. The igneous rock will then filter its way up through the rails. These rails will get pretty hot. And then we have three steam turbines to take that heat out. Once the igneous rock gets all the way through here, it is dumped into this pool of petroleum. Now, this pool of petroleum is going to be super cold along with the steam turbines. In fact, that's probably enough petroleum there. Now you'll notice there's radiant pipes in front of the steam turbines and one right here. And we've used our new resource, the super coolant, to make sure this pool stays cold, which will finish off cooling the igneous rock for our use. And so you can see the long chain of iron ore conveyor rails into the conveyor chute. The only thing we really need to do now is drop a bunch of water in here. We don't have to fill this whole area up because we've already made it a vacuum. But this is going to be as easy as just using a bottle emptier and throwing a bunch of water in here. Now, I do want a lot of steam in this to absorb the heat. But we don't want so much steam that we're not able to run the steam turbines for as long. Because this space has about 200 tiles in it, we can figure out how much steam would be left in here. Each one of these tiles is able to hold about a thousand kilos worth of water. We definitely don't want that much. But for instance, if we put 200 kilos in, say, 10 tiles worth, 
we can then estimate there'll be 10 kilos of steam in each tile in this room. We're not going to get that precise with it. We're just going to have the dupes drop off a bunch of water and see how it goes. This is another reason why I set up the little example and test it first. Even with the example, I still managed to flip the memory toggle the wrong way. Time to get in there and fix that. Remember when I told you that speed control mods can mess up your simulations? Here's a perfect example. On normal speed, the door opens and closes just fine. Because right now the temperature in the room is below 180 degrees, it's functioning perfectly. Door opens, door shuts. Just enough time for a little bit of magma. But watch what happens when I turn it up to times 9 speed. You can see, half the time, the door doesn't even open. It just goes to try to unlock, and it's just weird. There's something to keep an eye out for when you're building these automation setups. Alright, we have a, almost 400 kilos of water in each tile. Now all we have to do is wait. Looks like the next activity on this is 42 cycles. And I just cannot let this episode go without at least seeing this thing in action. And also so I can get in there and fix whatever problems that we have with it. It's for that reason that we're going to close this up, but not completely. We're just going to stick one more insulated tile right there. And that'll keep steam from coming in and possibly messing with the petroleum. And if this steam gets out of control and gets up to a thousand degrees, then it would turn the petroleum into sour gas. And then, you know, and then I get sad and put my head into my hands and weep. And sadly, Rover 2 is near the end of his days. You can see he's got 1.4 kilojoules left. He did a decent job. He got all the way to the Abyssalite. Can't cut through the Abyssalite because he doesn't have the super duper hard digging skill. Uh, but we've seen enough of this planetoid to know the tree is not here. Thanks for your service, little buddy. I wanted to take an opportunity to show you some of the interesting bugs that pop up from time to time. This here seems to be an English rock death spike sent from the heavens. Each one of these tiles is 25 tons of 1400 degree igneous rock. Now, obviously we didn't do anything to cause 25 tons of igneous rock just to be placed here. And it goes all the way down. It's like this spike just buried itself through the world. I'm definitely not a save scummer, but this is what I consider one of the acceptable reasons to reload. There's obviously some sort of bug that is really messing with the simulation. After a little bit of research, I have found that this specific bug can occur when there's debris laying around and it tries to form a tile. It's still a nasty little bug. It doesn't matter how far I go back, it seems like it's always there. The best recommendation I found was to go into sandbox mode and remove it. The only other solution other than sandbox mode is to literally load it up, cue the dig commands, put it on a very high priority and hope the dupes can get to it before you know it destroys our entire volcano sauna and superheats our base. Let's, uh, let's give this one a whirl, shall we? We're going to prioritize the tiles outside of the volcano sauna first, but don't kid yourselves, this is still too hot for inside the volcano sauna. It's also going to break just about every machine around here. Let's see how it goes. So we have another problem, and it's invisible tiles. You can see here, there's 25 tons of igneous rock at 1200 degrees, so it keeps melting everything around it. I'm going to try to fix it by putting a regular tile in place, and then putting the mesh tile back. There's another one here. And another one here. It looks like everywhere there was a mesh tile. The last business at hand is sweeping up the very hot igneous rock from around the base and inside the sauna. We have this guy set on sweep only and allow manual use. And it's collecting all the raw minerals that may be too hot. The issue is... The dupes have to make it through our liquid lock without dropping the 
1400 degree igneous rock inside the petroleum, turning all this into sour gas. Fingers crossed. Our steam turbines are having a field day. Every single one of them is going off full bore. And we're still getting some overheats here and there. But I think generally we have the disaster cleaned up. I don't want to dig this up. I'm afraid if we dig it up, the same sort of bug will happen. I don't know. I cannot deal with another bug like this. It is taking far too long to fix it. And at far too great of a cost. But we will see. All right, our volcano is finally getting ready to abrupt. And we've made a couple of changes in the background before this whole thing turns into a steam. And this area here becomes impossible to get to. We added another insulated tile block because we want to make sure that it is a one tile gap that produces our magma blade. Additionally, we upgraded these temperature shift plates to diamond. We had enough diamond laying around, so I figured, hey, what's better than some better thermal conductivity? Also, we put a timer sensor on the auto sweeper. There's a couple of reasons why. We want the igneous rock to sit here and bake for a little bit, especially at the beginning while this thing's churning up, because we want the igneous rock to turn all this water into steam. Incidentally, we've also turned this conveyor loader off. The timer sensor is set on 5 seconds for green, 200 for red. What this basically means is the auto super will fire three times a cycle, and when it does, it'll go for five seconds at a time. And the reason why you need between five, six seconds is because the auto sweeper needs enough time to pick up the igneous rock from here and deliver it to this conveyor loader. Now I'm hoping everything is set right. I've had to reload this game many times trying to deal with that bug. So fingers crossed. And here comes the beautiful magma now. Now notice the blade. You'll see that the front of the blade is very small and it gets bigger and bigger until this one tile gap. Remember, this magma blade is made to be 10 tiles long because we don't want a big heaping amount of magma. We just want the very little bit at the end. All right, magma drops for the first time and instantly because of this cool temperature shift plate, it formed into igneous rock. The igneous rock, when it formed a solid, was pushed into the corner as you just saw, and then drops down into this spot. And it's doing it again. Just a little bit of magma, turns into igneous rock, slides over, and then drops down to these temperature shift plates. Now, at the beginning, we're going to get a lot more igneous rock than we necessarily want. And it's because this water is soaking up so much of the heat so quickly. Once this thing is running, it should be a much slower process. In fact, to limit the amount of igneous rock in here for now, we're going to set this on, say, 75 degrees. So it'll turn the thermo sensor off and lock the door. More on the magma blade, you can see here, even though magma is still pouring out through here, the smallest part of the magma blade is 291 kilos. So when it drips over into the door tile, when the door opens, it's even smaller than that. You can see the size of the magma blade getting larger and larger. And the amount that we end up in here is just about 57 kilos. So why do we want so little magma to come through each time? Well, because you can see this volcano is not going to erupt again for another 13 and a half cycles. Which is fine, but we want to make sure we don't eat through all of this magma at once. Now, if we notice this tank is getting particularly full, we don't want to overpressure the volcano. Then we can increase the amount of time that the door is open, which will allow more magma to flow through. Now, this will take a little while to heat up because this is a lot of water. We have about 385 kilos in each tile, and that's a lot of heat to absorb. All right, we're finally getting some beautiful steam. Won't be long now before this whole thing is pressurized. I've kind of helped it along by moving a little bit of igneous rock over to here. To do that, I just turn on the conveyor loader real quick, pause it, and once the auto sweeper loads it into the conveyor loader, I uncheck it. A little bit gets through, but it's nothing our petroleum bath won't be able to handle. In addition to all the water needing to heat up into steam, all these conveyor rails will also have to absorb heat the ladders, everything in here will have to come up to temperature. Now that the thermo aqua tuner is covered in steam, we can turn it on. And we're going to say if the temperature of the coolant is above zero degrees. Yeah, we have super coolant being used as a coolant and it has no problem getting down to zero and staying there. As an example of the power of super coolant, 
we eventually had to put a total of six thermo aqua tuners into our volcano sauna. And that's when we were running petroleum as a coolant. Well, in the background, I changed all of the petroleum to super coolant. So now one thermo aqua tuner, sometimes two, can cool all of the steam turbines to 25 cool degrees. And that's the power of super coolant. You need less thermo aqua tuners and your thermo aqua tuners run less, which saves you a lot of power. You can also see, thanks to the immensely hot igneous rock bug, all of our steam turbines are running flat out. I shudder to think of the amount of wished power we're not using. All the water is now gone. Nothing but steam in here. And you can see we have about 28 kilos of steam pressure in the room. Right now, it's not even hot enough for the steam turbines to activate, really. The only reason this one's going is because the thermo aqua tuner. So I figured we'd turn on our conveyor loader and see what kind of damage we can do. As an example, we'll hit reset timer. And it's got enough time to load just about a full conveyor load. It'll send the igneous rock, which is still pretty hot, through these rails. You can see... This is not a great example because we've been playing with this igneous rock and it's had to sit in the water. But right now this igneous rock is coming out at 590 degrees and it's exiting the steam room at about 187. Now eventually this petroleum will get down to zero, but you can see already the petroleum here can eat that heat pretty well. All right, we're gonna go ahead and kick this up a notch. We're gonna go below 180 degrees you can open the door this is a much more realistic example you can see the igneous rock is coming out at 900 and something degrees and before it leaves the steam room it's about 270 not too bad i think in the future i might put a conveyor rail temperature sensor and have it recycle through the rails one more time i could still get in there through this and add that functionality but I'm going to let this thing cook up for a little while and see how it plays out. Last cycle's power generation, 11,600 kilojoules. And we only used 6,100. <laughs> Alright, we're up and running normal. Very little igneous rock drops, and then when the auto sweeper grabs it, it's already down to about 1,200 degrees. You can see we increased the red duration, so now the auto sweeper will only pick up twice a cycle. And these steam turbines are having no problems keeping up. Looks like it's hovering around 165 to 175 degrees in here. Which is good. We have our temperature threshold at 180. I think this has been a resounding success. You know, other than the huge colony destroying bug that we had to deal with. This one took a long time to produce, especially with the bugs. I've captured these stats from my recording software and you can see my rig has no problem keeping up with the simulation it's more of the simulations constraints itself I'm not even able to run the speed at times nine now and have to stay at max at times three otherwise more weird things happen I hope you had as much fun watching this episode as I did making it talk to you soon <laughs>